Welcome to the D&D Fitness Radio Podcast, brought to you by your hosts, Don Saladino from New York City and Derek Hansen from Vancouver, Canada. Thank you. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, did you guys just work out? Yeah, yeah, we just finished. A little back. <clears throat> A little back work. Not today. How you feel? Uh, not bad. Not bad. I, I did a lift yesterday. I didn't. Yeah, I'm feeling okay. So I was sick last week. So feeling a bit better. How's the weather in Vancouver? Finally getting a little warmer, feeling a little like spring. So we we cracked the door. The reason why we cracked the door today, I know it's a little cold in here, was because we had the air tested. The air quality in here is phenomenal. But the carbon dioxide is too. Now he tells. <laughs> it's no. too high. Really? It's too high. <laughs> it's just no. It's not that the air quality. There's no chemicals, but because this place is so sealed, there's not enough fresh air coming in. So oh. we open. I open the door today and I actually feel a little bit more alert. We just um, trained so hard. I feel, I feel good. We had a good. We had a good workout today. A lot of sets. How many sets for back? Like yeah, over thirty something. Yeah, yeah thirty something. It, it, it was nuts. I need a. Uh, you know what I got yesterday? Huh. I was at Wild Nature. I got badger. You ever see the badger cream? Like it's like almost like a mineral ice. What was that? Tiger bomb. Tiger it's badger. <laughs> now it went from a tiger to a badger. <laughs> it's like badger bomb. I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. So Derek, we're here right now, right? Because uh, so we brought our guest today, Frank Seppi, who I'm still going to introduce, even though I feel like in my world he needs no introduction, right? I mean, this was. One of the guys, I mean, I consider him one of my closest friends, but he was one of the guys I think heavily motivated me at a really young age. Um, he's also the guy that I think was uh, is in an industry that we both love a lot, but I think it's very tough to be able to go to the next level, right? I think it's, um, yes. I think percentage wise, you see a lot of bodybuilders and they kind of get caught. And Frank at a very young age recognized that he does love the industry, but he was going to get a little bit more entrepreneurial and let's just say go a little bit more of a business route. So there's a few things I really want to get into today. One, Frank's in his 50, 51? 51. 51 years old. He looks like he's 31. That's one. Two, he's training with me and I have trouble keeping up with him on I mean, that's how strong this guy is. So I think that says something there. And how is he continuing to excel and 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 move in the right direction when we're in, we're in a time where people are just like, oh, you're getting older. I'm like, yeah, but you're yeah. getting better. Like, I'm trying to get better. Yep. And um, I think that business piece of all this, right? And uh, yeah, books, infomercials, like eight books, stuff, over five hundred covers. He's he's been on. I mean, there's there's not infomercials. He's he started. He's built products. Um, he understands. For, he runs all the digital media for Muscle Fitness, Muscle Fitness, hers, Flex Magazine. Um, yeah. He's got a big Olympia. He's got a big position. So um, thanks for coming on. Happy to be here. I'm here four times a week. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing too it's just fun it, it, it yeah, it's just, it's fun we just have a good time it's it's we're in we're in our training sessions and we're just enjoying it so i know i'm actually banged up today i feel like you know shoulder a little bit broken wing well i saw when you walked in today i looked at you i was like yeah, right? <laughs> I was it's like, so funny him and i know each other so well he'll look at me some days and be like you're right and i'm like yeah like i won't even admit it because usually you know like my girl came over last night so i was i didn't get to bed till like jesus <laughs> The one. She, she kept him up all night. He kept her up all night. She loses. His control. control. What was that again? What was that? Uh, blind, blind, blind date. Blind date. She loses His control. control. Um. So yeah. So Derek, this is this is this is the man. And you've okay. met. Yeah, we've met. Yeah, we've yeah, met. yeah, yeah. Been there a couple of times. Um. Okay. So you're. Let me get this straight. You're 51, which is incredible. Um. I'm I'm 53, turning 54, and weightlifting for me has become more and more difficult it's almost like a motivation thing so i'm wondering at my age how do you keep doing it because like i i mean like i i weightlifted since whatever eight 18 mm -hmm. 18 years old and more more for just training for track and field and 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 and, and stuff like that but but i and right now if i have if you said okay let's go lift i'd be like ah <laughs> Like, I, I just, I just don't have the same passion. Yeah. Um, so how do you do it? I started lifting at 13. So it was part of my lifestyle, like brushing your teeth. So it was one of the things that I enjoyed the most in my day, no matter what, how old I was, what point of life I'm at, 
lifting weights mentally and physically was amazing for me. Like when I don't do it for a couple of days, I am the crabbiest, angriest person. I get down, I get depressed. But when I train, it's just part of me now. And as you get older, you have to check your ego and just be like, look, I can't lift as much as when I was 20 years old in certain movements because it's just wear and tear on your body or just, just general age. But there are certain things I do better. And I focus on those, on those things. And it encourages me, you know, I set little goals for myself. So, you know, people are like, oh, you look good for your age. I don't want to look good for my age. I want to look good for anybody's age. So I always set these little goals. Like right now in 12 weeks, I set up eight photo shoots with the top photographers in the world. And I know I have to be prepared. So it's things like that. I set up little fitness projects. Uh, right now I'm training my son. He's 14. And I want to be an example for him. You know, when I go into the gym, he's like, dad, everyone talks to you. They're like, oh, you're 51. Like, I thought you were like 35, you know, this and that. So I think it's, for me, it's a lifestyle, but it never gets old. Uh, training with Don all the time now is, is great. Like you feed off each other's energy, you know, and then putting this out there and we get millions of views and such on all these social media channels and the inspiration you get from people too saying, hey man, you know what? Can't believe it. You guys are great. Or you did this or you did that fuels the fire you know but it's mm. part of me i can't explain it it's like when they asked arnold schwarzenegger I think jake paul asked arnold schwarzenegger he's like why do you still go to the gym and arnold said i'm gonna train to the day i die because mm. i love it you know you love being around the people you love the atmosphere way it feels like why because i'm 51 would i not train anymore like you know certain things click on certain individuals yeah. right i mean it's it's, you know, you hear the story of the kid growing up who suddenly the, the father bought him his first weight set or, a, or a, bat and a, a bat and a glove and a ball, and he just became obsessed. So you hear about all these stories of greatness. And in a way, I mean, you really got to attribute that to your father. Oh, absolutely. My dad was a uh, narcotics detective. Don loves this. They used to call him Tom. Tom the the arm. Arm. <laughs> so uh, my brother was a natural bodybuilder, my older brother. So we had weights in the basement and I used to sit on top of the stairs and just kind of watch what they did. And then when they left, I would use the weight set. And then when he found out, he'd beat, my brother used to beat the crap out of me. <laughs> Every Christmas uh, sibling rivalry, I would get a different piece of equipment for Christmas and I would be down there three hours a night, just working out, posters on the wall, Motley Crude blasting, just training. And, you know, my parents, my mom was like, just leave him down there. You know, I <laughs> had four, my four kids, leave him down in the basement. He's not bothering anybody. But by the time I was 17, I was 225 pounds. You know, just Olympic weight set, compound movements, you know, waiting for the magazines to come out, looking at the routines. You know, there was no science. Like diet was like, you know, wasn't really mm. a thing back then. You know, you worked in a deli, you're like, I always thought, I'm going to eat a pound of bologna because I'm going to put a pound of muscle on. <laughs> it wasn't until later in life you figure it out, you know? And it's just, yeah, something I grew, grew up, grew into, grew up with. I have, I have one question and I want to kick it over to, um, to uh, Derek. I, I mean, you look at these obsession with most people and it, it's kind of, it's kind of ironic because when you go into a bodybuilding gym or a hardcore gym, yeah, some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life are totally. some of the biggest individuals like you meet some competitors and they come up to you and they're humble and they shake their hand and they look at your hand and they look you in the eye and you know i know for me like i am got put in this direction because of specific issues that i had when i was a kid insecurities sure. or learning disabilities or hearing problems or whatever it might have been um you, you know i that's what i know helped it helped me and i think that's what really directed a lot of people um did you gain an obsession not only because of your father was there anything going on in your life that you were like no, I got to do this, or was it just a passion for uh, getting him in training? I was, well, I started at 13. I was a shy kid. Yeah. Incredibly thin. Okay. Incredibly thin. Like, you know, it was a little bit of a chip. Like Clint Eastwood, Adam's apple, Papa Adam. Yeah. <laughs> like really thin. Right. And uh, two older brothers who were muscular, you know, so which like kind of fueled that fire. But yeah. I think because I was shy. Um, and it was funny because later, 
when I put the size on, I was still that shy, skinny kid. So you develop almost body dysmorphia where you're like, do I look like that? Do yeah. I look like that? You know, even through yeah. you're like, wow, you're never satisfied. You still feel right. like that skinny kid. But I think, yeah, like most kids, I was, you know, shy and I was a loner like, you know, 13 to like 17. And then when I went to the commercial gym, my dad dropped me off <laughs> when I was 15. This is funny. First time I went to a commercial gym, uh, walked to the desk and the guy's like, yeah, can I help you? I'm like, yeah, I want to sign up. He goes, what do you want? The fireman or the cop special? <laughs> I'm like, I'm 15. He's like, you're not 15. Cause I was like 185 <laughs> at the vein in the biceps. And I was like, you know, I was like, oh, wow, you're 15. And he was an Olympic weightlifter. Did he give you a discount anyway? I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Was like, no. Gave you 15 years old, I would have been like, you look like that. Let's go, kid. So, yeah, he was an Olympic weightlifter. And I was 15. And this guy, like, he was one of those old Italian guys. Well, not at the time, but he's an Italian guy. He had a pad. I put the pad on to do squats. He took it off and beat me with it. He's like, we don't do pads. <laughs> Sissy squats. pads. Yeah, I'm doing cleans and jerks and everything else and like i learned a lot from uh from him he kind of took me under under his wing and he became an occupational therapist i think and he was an olympic weightlifter but he was a good guy joe gazio rest in peace okay uh who, so who was who was the influence who was like somebody that you watched on tv because it was kind of it would have been kind of past arnold right when he was competing and stuff um it was always my dad but from tv it was you had what we just talked about this. Arnold, yeah. Stallone, Mark Gaston of the Jets, yeah. <laughs> Hogan from the WWE. So you had those four it's guys. funny. I would have chosen my guys. I was know? less on Gaston out because I wasn't you a Jet I fan. wasn't a Jet fan, but <laughs> I remember the first time I saw the Hulk, that really messed Ferrigno me up. Too, yeah. yeah, like Ferrigno really messed me up in the head because I'll never forget watching a show and I was actually frightened to see this guy. Yeah. He was just so scary with that most muscular pose and, you know, the greenish white skin. And, you know, and I think that kind of, in a way, like almost frightened of him, but also in a way like attracted to that level of strength You're right. and power, right? Yeah. And he was, he's definitely five. I met him in, in uh, Golds in Venice after my show and I was doing a photo shoot and I hear, tuck in your stomach. And I was like, was Lou Ferrigno and I became friends with him at that time but it's funny every single one of my childhood heroes Stallone I met Hulk Hogan I met Mark Gaston treating Seahurst I met Arnold I met multiple times so it's like how many people can say that you know that you actually grew up to meet your you know the people that you were your who, who, who are you the most impressed with from a personality standpoint was it Hogan Hulk Hogan was the nicest guy yeah. that you can ever meet he was just a great guy i told you story. almost like welcoming right tell us tell yeah us. i was i was huge i was like 285 and 22 years <laughs> old i walked into gold venice and i'm like and i was actors act actress always like hey i could care less you know i really fanboyed on Hulk Hogan. i see him coming because i went to wrestlemania one with my dad like watched the rocky movies see hogan and i'm like hey i'm frank seppi nice to meet you. he goes i'm terry He's like, nice to meet you, brother. <laughs> I was like, holy oh, wow. And I'm like, I went to WrestleMania 1 when you beat the Iron Sheik. He's like, that was a long time, brother. Like, he was just like a really, he really nice. You feel he good. didn't have to be that nice. He could have been like, yeah, what's, you know, and some people are. Like, some people you meet and you're just like, wow, that guy was a real, you know. And I get it, too. It's like how someone approaches you really comes down. I mean, you see it on social media, right? Like, I I'll get questions sometimes and it's like, open i always open my dms but it'll be like i'm 5'10, 185 pounds <laughs> and it starts listing everything i'm like what do i need it's like or i get a dm that says hi i'm so and so been an, yeah. i've been a huge fan thanks so much for inspiring i'm so sorry to bother you but um you know I, I i'm doing this for x y and z and just wanted your opinion on it i'll answer that person I, and, and with celebrities sometimes you know, it's it's like, you know, some people, well, they didn't really sign up for this. They signed up to be um, in Hollywood. When you're on the street, like, you know, I understand when you're with your family and you're with your children. If like, you're eating dinner. Yeah, like give, yeah, them, give, them, some, give them some space. Their kids. Uh, right. If they're on the red carpet or they're in a work environment yeah. where they're going to be people, then, you know, play the, the game. Best, the best story is Arnold, right? So Arnold's at the, um, the Arnold Classic in Ohio. 
And I'm not going to tell you the competitor's name, but he wins a show in certain division, right? So he's now, he's at the expo and he's doing interviews and he goes, Arnold, Arnold, he goes, can I, can I ask you a question? And Arnold turns and he goes, who are you? He goes, I just won your, <laughs> I just won your honor class. He goes, one question. I was like, wow. You know, like That's that, so I didn't awesome. like that at all. I'm like, That's who are you? Yeah. Yeah. And can I ask you one question? Yeah. I've always tried to give the benefit of the doubt, Derek, because you, you never know, like, you never know. Someone, he's Maybe. on the phone with his wife, his ex-wife, his been. mistress, whatever it is. Like, I, I witnessed it. I, 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 I housekeeper. He could have been on the phone with his mistress. He could have just found out that he has a kid that he didn't know about. Right? I said no questions. So, yeah, I, I said exactly. no questions. So I always try and give the benefit of the doubt. And, and um, but, um, you know. It's, but it's just funny because everyone else is, you know, there was like, oh, yeah, what do you want to know? Like, you know, like you have Michael Hearn, you have other people who are like just an answering every question. But you're right. You don't know what's going on that day. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. No. <laughs> Right. Okay. <laughs> so that leads to the next logical question. Did anybody try to get you, hey, you should be in Hollywood, you should be an actor, you should be an action star based on, on some of those influences? So we both worked for this modeling agency back in the day. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I started, or before I was bodybuilding, I was doing a Versace and Armani uh, shooting at Fashion and some other stuff. And then, um, I got involved with an agency and they're like, oh, you should do movies or whatever. I'm like, okay. So I try out for Carlito's Way or Al Pacino. Of course, Carlito's Way. Yeah. Yeah. So I go down to the set and I'm sitting there. Were you a bouncer? I was a bouncer throwing yeah. somebody I out. I so that. this is so funny. So Don's, so Don's a guy I'm throwing out. So I walk in with the suit, come in. I physically manhandled this guy to throw him out. Like after the eighth take, like, cause they had to shoot wides and everything else. The guy's like, hey, man. He's like, just put your hands on me. I jumped out, of the, I jumped out of the seat. When we went back to change, the guy had bruises all over his chest. I was like, oh. but I was there for like 18 hours a day. And how stupid was I? I was 22. So uh, I think Brian De Palma was the director of that. So a girl comes up to me. Star Yeah. Yeah, hey, the guy's a legend. She goes, uh, Mr. De Palma wants to know if you have any acting experience. Now, if you would ask me now, but like, yeah, oh, definitely, yeah, I studied with the greats. You know, I just tried to pull it off. I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, just stupid. Like, I did that. I did the shortcut to happiness with Alec Baldwin. I did a bunch of things like TV commercials, but I never, I wasn't, I wasn't passionate about it. If I was, I would have studied and I would have, I would have you know, did it. But it was boring for me. Like, you know. Obviously, it would have been a better career path, maybe, for money-wise. I don't know. But how many people make it in Hollywood? But I was there for 16 hours a day. I you're also train. a really unique look, too. Like, your your unique size, your unique look. He almost, like, the, the thing that was cool about Arnold was that he can move. He was big, yeah. but he can move. He came and in at the right time. And too. you're And you're technically, like, the size they say Arnold was is really the size you are. I mean, they were all the, you know, it was always like Arnold was 6'2", 235. You're 6'2", 240, roughly. So you're technically like Arnold, I met him in person. He's not, no. now obviously, we're, we're all shrinking now, right? But I don't know if he was, yeah, I mean, obviously, when he was an Olympia uh, competitor, I mean, I could see him being 235, 240. Um, he didn't have your height, though, I feel like. No, I mean, look, when you come into, you're new and you come into an industry where you're, you know, you don't look like cookie cutter, you're going to either yeah. be a bouncer, a cop, a uh, a villain of some sort, mm. <laughs> you, know, you know, or the big dumb guy. You know, you're not going to be like, you know, Arnold came in as a robot or Conan, you know, the rock came in as a scorpion king. You know, think about it. Like everybody who had, you know, the muscular physique. And John Cena. John yeah. Cena yeah. was the Marine. Like, yeah. you know, it was like, you know, you, you're coming in as the the love interest of Charlize Theron or something. <laughs> so wait a second. So so you were you were 21 years old and you were probably at that time the number one up and coming bodybuilder on the planet. Like you were the, or maybe you rephrased it, 22, you were the you were the hot topic, right? Like everyone. Like you were on every magazine cover. You had this massive look. He was 315 pounds at one time at six foot two. 
when did you and, and you won the Mets, right? You yep. won the East, the Eastern, yep. the Easterns. I can see. I know this, right? I was, I was, you know. So Frank's fifty-one. I'm going to be forty-six. So Frank had five years on me. So when Frank was twenty-two, you know, I was sixteen, seventeen. Mm. So we were like the young guys in the gym, me and Steve Rico. Yeah, and we'd see Frank. We did. Hi, Frank. <laughs> we were all like, <laughs> we were all like pumped to see him. But you made you made a massive pivot really quickly. So yeah. So. The only time when I was 22, I was modeling and stuff. I went to a bodybuilding show and I was like, oh, I think I'm going to jump in on one of these things. And I died for like eight weeks and I won, which is a national qualifier. Skipped the, the, the lower level thing, won a national qualifier. I was 240 pounds. So 21, 22, I won the whole show. So then I was like, oh, this is cool. You know, whatever. But I need to make money. So I went back to modeling, slimmed down. And I'm like, well, you got 12 weeks to the Mets, which is the biggest, the Metropolitan, it's like a Mr. New York show. You go, wow, I should do this. I could do this in 12 weeks. They're like, what, you're way too small. Went in, shredded 250, <laughs> and I won the whole show. And then after that, ESPN American Muscle Magazine, I went to L, uh, Venice, shot magazine covers and all the stuff. And then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give this a solid year to go into i'm going to skip the junior national skip the juniors i'm going to go into the ifb north american and go against the best guys in canada mexico and try to get a pro card at 20 i just turned 23 trained for saudi got up to 267 pounds on stage shredded but that's insane you know as well as i do you don't have the muscle maturity until you're a little bit older but i went in there placed i was fifth place out of like 30 something guys and a lot of those guys are very angry that <laughs> I beat them because here I come. They will put me on the covers where Encyclopedia Bodybuilding, where Dorian Yates won six Olympias, and there's a snapshot, and there's a whole big giant picture of me. So I wasn't very liked by the bodybuilders because they were like, Who is this? And then, you know, you're on a cover. And I'm like, We discussed this. You're not on a cover because they're your friends. You're on a cover because you sell magazines. So I have a look. For the yeah. first time, so I think myself and Arnold were the only person where I'm back-to-back -back covers for Muscle and Fitness hmm. the same months. And I was like, didn't really realize, you know, sink into now, like you had, you had all the major celebrities and everybody on Muscle and Fitness was just, to put you on two covers in a row. I was like, wow, that's, that's sick out of 12 issues. So, but after my show was too, yeah, pre-judging, I started cramping up so badly abs were popping out individually and they were pushing them back in and i was like so dehydrated after that show i went from 267 to 314 pounds it was like I, my mother was there my brother was there i was like i'm not doing this i'm like because i knew if i had to move on at my height what i had to do to get to the level that i needed to to win at the olympia level or the pro level that i was not willing to do that so i was like either i move on now cut ties and just go the opposite way because i you know was known as the gq bodybuilder handsome bodybuilder so maybe i can make money as a fitness model more than i could you know competing because i never really liked competing it was also a brutal time to compete like if you were going to go to the olympia level this is Arnold. what 1990 uh 96 90 yeah Jesus, so Ronnie hasn't even won yet. So Ronnie won. Ronnie. Dorian Yates, Flex Wheeler. Uh, Lavrone, Sean Ray, Ray, Sean Ray, Cormier. <laughs> you had arguably, that was the Leo era, Lada. in my opinion, that was the, the era nice where you, that was the greatest era ever in bodybuilding. You had five to seven guys that are like Hall of Fame bodybuilders. Taylor, Taylor. And most of them didn't win. Chris Cormier, yeah. Like Cormier, Cormier never won. Like, but these, some of these guys don't get good until they're probably in their late 30s, 40s. So I was 22, 23. So if I were to say, let me take five years off, come back. Because uh, in my class, 96, Jay Cutler just won for the national. So if I would have took time to compete, it would have been me, Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler. Like, you know what I mean? So I was like, let me do a quick pivot here and, and see what I can do. Because I never really liked putting the posing chunks on and the oil and going up. But I love the training and I love the, the goal of getting into the best shape. But at the end of the day, it is apples and oranges when you're stepping on stage of who you like and who you don't like. And 
you know, structurally, there's certain things that you can't change no matter what you do, whether like, you know, you look at Gasparri, there was no way he was ever beating Lee Haney, you no. know, just from a structure standpoint. So Haney was yeah. also a lot taller than him or what? Well, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, but I was just saying like, yeah, it just didn't make didn't make any sense. Plus, you know, it's when Gerard Dente told me something. He's like, his father came to the show and he's like, his, he's, uh, he's like, who's that guy? And he goes, that guy's a uh, top champion in the world. And he goes, oh, really? He's selling T-shirts? He goes, Michael Jordan doesn't sell T-shirts in the lobby of everything. So, That's the know. tough thing about the go guard there. I was just going to ask, like, can you explain to us, like, just the financial piece of like, okay, I'm a competitive bodybuilder. How how much money are you making? Is it worth the time that you're putting in? And and at what point did you say like back then? Um yeah. it's funny, back then at 23, I had a six-figure contract with metrics, sports nutrition. Um, I also had deals with clothing companies. Um, and I use it, I always thought you you know, I was in modeling and stuff, so I was making a lot of money, but I was like, what am I going to use this as a springboard for? Other people are like, I'm going to stay in this bodybuilding, you know, like top bodybuilders in the world, I'm making seven figures easily, you know. Um, but it's like a caste system. <laughs> it was like the very rich and the very poor, you know. But what I did was used it to my advantage. I'm like, oh, you want me to do a cover? I want to write an article mm. for the magazine. And they're like, go ahead. Because I'm sure no one asked. I'm like, I want a column in your magazine. I'm like, okay. I, had, I did 10 years. I did a column for Muscle Mag. Um, and I'm like, can I get a, an ad? It's only paper. So I used to sell that for like 2,500 a month, five grand a month. So where these guys were like training people, you know, and this and that, I was getting five grand a month for putting an ad in. Then as a trainer, I was like, I put all training information. And I'm like, all right, you know what? Now I got 144 columns here in this, and I'm right. I, I would use that as leverage to write for my life. I wrote for Cosmo, Lucky. I wrote for all these hard, all these magazines, and then eventually put them all together and um, started writing. I put a proposal together for a book, but before that, it was a company came to me, Nature's Bounty, which is the largest company in the world for supplements, manufacturing supplements. They had me run their magazine division. So I was running four magazines. I was editor in chief of two, um, editor in chief of the Metrics magazine, wrote the book for Metrics, their entire book, like a 200 page book on body shaping. Um, I just used it all to my advantage to do, to do things that I, you know, to make money and things I was passionate about. Whereas it was just guys who were like, I just wanna get big and I just wanna compete. I was like, let me use this to go here. You know, and then everything leads to something. You write a book, home shopping, infomercials, and then I'd work behind the scenes, director of marketing for some companies, social media strategist, director. Like I would keep a lot of eggs in the basket. It was it was it was, it was interesting to see how some of the bodybuilders. I mean, you know, when they're on that platform and they're competing, you know, who's able to, you know, segue to something more. Yeah. Fruitful, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you look at a Jay Cutler or you look at an Arnold or you even look at a Bumstad who's in the meat of his career right now. And this kid's, he's the classic physique champion who is the hottest bodybuilder in the whole sport right now, by far. I mean, social you, media changed the social game. media changed the game, but it's also, I think a lot of these people surrounded themselves with individuals that, you know, were either able to help or, sure. were, or they recognize that, you know, there's got to be something beyond this. And um, some of these guys don't have a plan B. They're just like, I want to be a bodybuilder. I want to be big. And look, I understand, you know, and there's certain bodybuilders who have jobs already. Like Steve Kuklo was a fireman. Nice guy, by the way. Very. Very nice guy. I Ronnie mean, Coleman. Yeah. Cop. And they, they asked Ronnie Coleman, they're like, why are you still a cop? You just won Mr. Olympia. He goes, because I love it. You know, like he was able to do to do both. You know, but there's a lot of people have their Miss Supplement business. If you look at Lila, they made millions like Lee LeBron. LeBron, right. You know, people like that have come, you know, Lee Haney does well. Like there's a lot of different, Jay Cutler's multiple businesses. But if you go into bodybuilding right now, the prize money for the top for Mr. Olympia is like three to $400,000. 
for the top prize. That's from Mr. Olympi. But yeah, if you think about that, it's not a lot of money, right? It's it's the amount of time that you're spending, the amount of dedication going into the sport. I mean, it's not this is not a sport that you prep for in a year. I think that's a misconception from the general public is that, oh, okay, but guys taking steroids or, you know, I can get there or or like this is not a couple years of hard work. This is decades. Most of these guys are putting their time in for decades to get to this level. I mean, it was very impressive to see uh, Dexter Jackson in his 40s when the when the Olympia, 50, I'm sorry, yeah. 50 years old, win the Olympia. He looks great. Like, think about that. Like, you're man. now 50 years old. He was best in the world in his sure. class, which to me is like 50. Like, the age is, you know, I, I, they always used to say in sports, you're going to hit your prime around 28. I, I don't know if they were accurate with that because you're seeing athletes now hit their primes a little bit later in their career. You're seeing Tom Brady, Tom TV Brady, 12. you know, <laughs> you know yeah, it's look, Barry yeah. Bonds, granted whether he was on stuff or not, it doesn't matter. You still got to hit a round ball around that coming at you at hundred miles an hour. And it is what it is. It is, what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you win the title of anything. It leads to other opportunities. Like in, back in the day when you were UFC champion, there wasn't a lot of money now there is with pay-per-view and everything else but as a ufc champion you're able to do other things speaking engagements products whatever it may be and that's kind of the thing you win the olympia like chris bumstead probably makes way more money obviously on just on a social media page and he i think it's forty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars the top prize for classic physique yeah, that's not. So I don't think it's that's not even, that's not even paying for half his food for the year. It's like no, but it put out one video of him eating an M and M, and it'll get five million views. Yeah. So it's like he just put up one post a day and make forty grand. You know, like yeah. just that. Just that's what it. Leads but he also you also have to stay relevant, and I think a lot of these, whether they're bodybuilders or athletes or celebrities, like using that as a segue, you know, I've spoken to some bodybuilders about it that are kind of like, Oh, I'm not going to compete. I have another business. Or, yeah. I'm thinking about competing. And I'm like, compete. Like the more you could be in that spotlight now, even if you finish last, like if you have a business, it's going to, it's going to help propel that. Don't you think or no? Yeah. I ran into a guy who he's a manager of like a, a local gym franchise and he's just got married he's, you know as a kid and he's like oh i'm focusing i'm not going to compete i'm focusing on my job and i'm like these guys make it out way too much to to what it really is i'm like you don't have an hour and a half in the morning and an hour at night when you're competing like when you're in the free contest to train you're telling me you can't you know schedule six meals a day eat them what are you going to eat now that you're not competing and you can't add an hour to an hour and a half of your day to train Give me a break. I don't know whether or not they're talking about drugs or what they're taking or whatever, but everyone has time. Mm. You can be the busiest guy in the world. You can't train for an hour in the morning. Like, oh, it what's is. it going to take? Like, think about your best workouts as a kid and how much mass you put on and stuff. It's like, it's just, I don't think it's a mindset. I also think it's that priority too. It's, it's what are you prioritizing in your life? Yeah. Like, I never understood the trainer who was like, oh, uh, I'm too busy. I have too many clients. And I'm like, I would purposely not take a client on just to get my session in. Because I knew what I, that would do to me mentally, let alone physically. Um, oh, yeah, totally. D? So getting back to training. So, it, you know, I, I kind of noticed like, you know, my strength probably was pretty good even in my late 30s. But then I noticed things started to decline and I was getting sore all the time in my joints. So what are the what are the levers you're pulling to change your training? Like, is it a volume decrease is it an intensity decrease is it a combination do you how do things fluctuate right do you decrease volume Frank? no so <laughs> <laughs> i'm a volume guy like i'm definitely a volume when i we mix in a lot of different things so it depends on the ebb and flow of how you feel mentally physically and you come in every day you're not going to feel the same some days you come in and we're gonna do five sets of five and we're like let's go we're wired we're like we could do this, you know, and other days like today, do like 30 something sets of volume. So you gotta, you gotta like learn your body, you know, mm -hmm. you gotta figure out how you feel, you know, like you can't take a piece of paper and go, okay, here's my plan. Five, you know, you have to deviate from it by the way you feel, whether you didn't have enough sleep, whether you miss a meal, whatever, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, you gotta walk out 
having a good workout, whether it's a pump, whatever, no matter how we feel, whether it's, we feel a hundred or 50, we walk out that day, like, wow, got a great pump, great job. You We're know? always feeling successful. I think, you know, that's yeah. what you're always allowing yourself to feel successful. And I'm, you, you know, I'm big on the writing programs and I, I've always followed templates, but you need, a, you but need, this, a, you need a, a base to follow, but he's right. I mean, when you're listen, let's face it. Like when you're in your twenties, you're in this honeymoon phase of just showing up and feeling like a machine every workout. When you're in your 40s, late mid 40s, mm -hmm. the thing that I feel like has really changed because I know my body composition has gotten better and I know I'm as strong as I've ever been and maybe even stronger in lifts. The thing that really changes is that freedom to be able to throw in frivolous stuff consistently and just recovering from it. So like, all right, like, you know, if I, you know, when I was 25, I could back squat and play hockey five days a week and no problem. Now I got to think about that a bit differently. Maybe the bar is not going on my back. Maybe it's unilateral work. Right. So then you start thinking about this stuff differently. It's like, if you're turning around and you've been hammering the, the weights and, and, and hammering cardio all week and someone's like, Oh, let's go for a 12 mile run. All right. Like you're going to think about that a little bit. Where in the past you would just go do it. Right. So I feel like that's, what's changed. It's not because you're, you're strong. You're mobile. Like we work mm -hmm. a lot on mobility. You got great endurance. You got incredible body composition. What's really changed is that I think it's really this level of self-assessment every day because we're coming in. And even if we have a template on paper, it's like, all right, how are you mentally? Mm -hmm. Like if you're coming in and you're like, I'm just dreading this today. And my body is not set up for this today. I'm not a believer that we should do it because it's on paper. Why? What's the point? When you're in your twenties, you feel like nothing can hurt you. You feel like, you know, I'm bulletproof. Nothing's going to stop me. So you throw 500 pounds on the bench. You're like, I'm going to beat this mentally. You're like, I'm coming in now. <laughs> you're like, you know what? Maybe at the end of this, I'm going to, I'm going to do a high rep set. You know, we're going to do 30 reps or 20 reps, or we're going to add a super set or, or a drop set or something. And, and then you walk out and you're pumped. So different feeling but great results same great you know same great results so you just got to play around with things like you have to be smarter too because when you do feel a little something like i have an issue sometimes with my bicep back off i do something else i don't stop i work around it you right with a quad right your quad we work my, around it my quad was bothering me for, yeah and that was my quad was bothering me for a few weeks through through hockey normally my body would recover and it wasn't it wasn't so i had to call some audibles I've recovered. And now rather than being an idiot and jumping right back in all, you know, now it's like, all right, we're being cautious. And now I'm phasing. I'm kind of like transitioning back into, but you know, it's really been a savior for us. And I saw this through, um, through a DEXA scan report, but I think machines have gotten a really bad rap in the strength and conditioning world. Yet every strength and conditioning coach that I see when they're traveling to a different gym is doing a leg press or a hack squat or doing something different. I went in for a DEXA scan when I was training with Arash and I went, uh, Arash couldn't back squat at the time. I'm big into back squat deadlifts. You know, I love free weights and Arash for six months, we worked that pendulum or that hack squat. We did, you know, walking lunges, rear foot mm -hmm. elevated, but we would always start with that compound movement and we were going volume, high rep, volume, volume. My entire body composition when I went in for my DEXA, all my upper body stayed the exact same. The biggest change I made was my lower body training. And I gained eight pounds of muscle in my lower body. Yeah, My DEXA report literally came back and I was like, holy shit. I was not overloading the joints. I was not causing any damage every in my body. I was still doing my sprint work and stuff that, that you have me do. So I still was maintaining this level of athleticism and stability. I'm sorry, mobility, the combination of flexibility and stability. And I was going in and focusing on hypertrophy safely. So, and you, and you hear like free rates are better, like nonsense, nonsense. We talk about this all the time. Yeah. It's like if you look at different people and what makes them tick and what progress they get from it, it's like, it, it, there's nothing cookie cutter. Like if I went in and did legs, like I used to go into a leg, I'm notorious for what you would consider overtraining, you know? Cause I love to do volume. I do a ton of sets. I might do 60 sets for a body part some days, 50 sets. And like, and I'll do two, three times a week. And, you know, even Steve Weinberg, like training too much. 
I'm like, am I? Because I'm 50 and I'm Shrek. <laughs> I'm like, like, it works for me. I know it works for me. Like, you know, and they're doing like, I, I remember working out with uh, one of the top champions and we did like six sets, six for, for, um, for chest. And I'm like, we did a couple of warm up sets, but I'm like, six? I felt like I ate half a hamburger. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, I can't do this. So like, for me, um, I don't listen. I block out the noise. I know it works for me. When I was competing, I had skinny legs. My legs turned into the best body part. How? I was doing 30 sets of free squats a week, 10, 10, and 10. And when I would do a normal leg workout, I would do hacks. I would do leg extensions, hacks, leg press, back squat, four in a row, right? I'd work up, I'd do five sets. So we'd have 20 different you know, 20 different sets, we do giant set. And on the last set of leg press, I'd have 15 plates on each side and I would do a strip set, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, all the way down to one and then throw up or just walk out of the gym. Like, and I couldn't walk for three days, but my legs got huge and big, but you know what I mean? Like, how's that? Like, that's what that was the goal. Me. That was that was the, the I, goal. It's so I don't poo poo anybody's it's, like. It's difficult you know? to it's difficult to generalize, right? It's difficult to turn around and say Sorry. we all need to be doing this one size fits all. Now, in the strength and conditioning community, you hear more about this minimalistic approach. In the bodybuilding community, it's really about how much stimulus can we give to yeah. that muscle, and how can we get the body to recover as quickly as possible. It's almost. They're complete opposites, right? It's like this minimalistic uh, approach to perform and then this approach that we're just going to overload the body, but then we have to figure out a way to let it recover and come back and, and hit it again and again and again and again. It's interesting though, because I train with strength coaches, train with Olympic weightlifters and everyone else. And like, you know, and let's talk about PEDs and everything else. If they're all on, you know, if they're all on it and bodybuilders are on it, you know, the whole... I guess stigma of bodybuilders that the bodybuilders are taking more, <laughs> not necessarily. They just train differently yeah. and they eat differently. So when you train and you eat differently, you're going to look different. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's no science. Like, and some of the bodybuilders, some of the strength people, are like, oh, you know, bodybuilders, they don't, they're not as strong. Well, Ronnie Coleman was bench, it was squatting like eight, 900 pounds pre contest. Like, this is, you know, this is an example of everything for everybody. Well, so can I, you well can you talk about that for one second? Because I, I think the general public doesn't really understand the influence that nutrition truly has to become a champion, right? Like, and and I and I think it's because they might yeah. look at the athlete, right, Derek? And you might look at someone who's an Olympic runner and they're like, oh, you know, they eat healthy and they space their meals out, and but there's variability and there's inconsistency in that. When you are building a physique. When I say building a physique, I mean at the highest level. You've got that the, the okay. Ramon Dino coming into you or Chris Bumstead. Sure. They're talking to you about that. What is that strategy that they're taking? They're not waking up every morning going, "Oh, what's on the menu for today?" Like they have this stuff planned out. Like, can you talk about that a little? Yeah, bit? it's so funny because if you look at some of the what's the top receiver the football player is eating candy. Yeah. So he eats his candy and and one meal a day, and then you have Michael Phelps. He's eating ten thousand calories a day because he's got a he's got performance. Right, bodybuilders don't have to perform; they don't have to perform in the gym. Do you know what I mean? So with them, pre if you're trying to build a physique, number one obviously is protein. You know, okay. so back in the day, it used to be two to two point five grams of protein per body pound. God, you know how much that is. So I mean, so that means you were consuming what? Far, <laughs> I you, were, you were you were consuming what then? They, so I'll tell you, I was I, I I told you I found that program. So I was two fifty. I was eating five hundred grams of protein a day. My carbs were two fifty. And my fat, oh, that's pretty low. My carbs were two fifty, and my fat was around twenty thirty percent. Was was that contest? Yeah, was it? So it's contest. What were you off season then to get the three fifteen? Do you know how many grams of carbs you were having, or were you just? I double it. Yeah. So it'd be a yeah a double it and, and a protein. I would drop a little bit yeah. less, but it was yeah. But if you think about it, think about that. So you have what roughly what do we got? Four thousand calories at max. 40 with fats, maybe 4,200. How many people are consuming that just in junk food and stuff? Like, you know, now, unfortunately, everything has a calorie count on it. You go get a green tea and a muffin at Starbucks and you're at 1,200 calories. 
So it's like, and you, you know, it's funny as a bodybuilder. So you're doing 500 and you're doing 250, 200 carbs. Oh my God, you're starving all the time. Because when you eat good food, it doesn't satisfy you. I don't know about you, but aren't you, you're hungry all the time. Especially but, if your fat's low, you know? But uh, the 500 gram obviously is ridiculous. But if I was to recommend, it would be one gram to 1.5. It would have probably been about 250, 250, and 20 to 30% fat is mm. usually what it was. But some people are so carb sensitive that they won't have toothpaste with fluoride in it. They won't use toothpaste with fluoride because it makes them hold water. And then there's some people who will eat ice cream the day before a show or something. It's just it's just so relevant. I think so they get a little overboard. Some of the bodybuilders in the off season, like there was a guy who posted the other day and he was eating, he was at some diner and like every, I'm more of a purist. Like if I order pancakes, maybe blueberries in it, max. I'm not putting like sprinkles and whipped cream and chocolate syrup and all this crap on it. Like it grosses me out. Yeah. And these people are eating like chicken and waffles, like drowned in X, Y, and Z. And they're disgusting. Like, disgusting, like mess on their face. And like, I feel like they're almost going too far in that direction of like calories. Right. And they're just putting unhealthy crap in their body. Good crap. But look, the biggest gains I've ever made in my life is as a teenager, as a natural teenager. And what did you eat? Garbage. <laughs> you know, like, it's genetics. A lot of it is genetics. Like some people are just natural. Like I know playing high school football at one year, I came in and benched, was it 350? And I was like, I'm the man, I'm the man. <laughs> and the guy comes in, never, never lifted weights before. Arnold Camula, his name was. This big jack guy, looked like Bo Jackson, came in. Oh God. 400. He's like, from the Caribbean, he was. I was like, what the hell? Never lift your weights. Shredded, big arms. I'm like, do you even lift weights? Like, no. Like, there's just some people. There's some like, strong dudes. Like, it's crazy. I, I feel like it's less in Bevs now. Like, I don't. I in Bevs now, no. they're I not I don't anywhere near. Like, when I was 16 years old, I remember seeing guys in there that were like six six that had four wheels on their back at six six to have that weight squatting. That's over 430 pounds because you know the weight's heavier. Doing deep reps for sets of 10, six, 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 seven. Well, these guys, like he was working with a lot of the Jets. These guys were in there, like Fabini and all those guys were back there bench pressing four or 500 pounds for reps. And there was such a level of strength that you were around that, like, you just, from watching it, you just got strong. It was yeah, great. I used to train chess with the, I used to train them, like four of them, the offensive line from the Jets, Jason Fabini, uh, Jumbo Elliott, Elliot, Dave Laverne. Um, it was funny. So I outbent, I did more reps with 405 than for being uh, than uh jumbo. What's and the most amount like, of reps that you've ever done with 405? Uh 15. 15 with 405. But but by the way, let me be clear about something. 405 in that gym, they use the old in-tech plates. <laughs> sure. So and this is not this is not a theory. This isn't like I'm making this up. They're power lifters in there that walk around with a conversion sheet. So it'll show the 45 pound plates equals 48 to 49 pounds, depending on the plate. So if the majority of the plates are 49 pounds, that's four extra pounds per plate. So if you're looking at 405, that's 16 extra pounds per side. That's 32 pounds. 405 is really 437, yeah. right? 437. Think about that. It's crazy. So when you would go in there, the first time I took Tone, we put 225 on and I said, Tone, we're, we're repping sets of 10. And I'm sitting there and I'm like kind of laughing in the back of my head. And he's getting 10 and he's like, get up. He's like, shit, like, what is this, man? Like, <laughs> why do I feel, why am I so weak? And I didn't say a word. And I'm like, come here. And I grabbed the plate. I went over, I took it to the front. I put it down. He looked down. He goes, that's 49 pounds. Yeah. Like, do the math. We were doing that's 237, yeah. 237. Yeah. It's crazy. You get you, strong. You know, the, it's back in the day, you only had the magazines. And other than that, you'd maybe see some NFL highlights on the steel curtain of like, you know, these guys benching 600 pounds of Pittsburgh Steelers. So you never had all this information on social media where, wow, you can do incline hammer strength or you can do this. It was bench, deadlift, squat. You know, like, what can you do? Like, so when we went into the gym, you were recognized and appreciated or like, you know, by how much you benched or you deadlift or whatever i remember having anytime someone benched like over 400 would stop to watch to see if he can get it then before he was done everybody turned away 
because they didn't want to give him any adulation. So it was like, so back in the day, that was the big thing. Squat, deadlift, like power movements. Now it's like they could care less. They're like flexing abs, doing this. There's it's like, no one. I mean, there's no one movement. really strong in there. There's a couple of guys that I'll look at things and I'm like, all right, and I'm impressed by their technique, their approach. You see them resting between sets. Like the leg press with 30 plates. Like, yeah, that's another right. thing too. Like a lot of these young bodybuilders have gotten incredibly lazy. You know, these, these kids are going in there and it's like all machine work. It's all like, like he was, he said, you know, Olympic weightlifting set. He was focusing. What were the, what were the lifts you were focusing on when you were 16? The bench, yeah. The right. bench, squat, the barbell curl, the deadlift, the shoulder press. Cycle. Six, two and a half, six, two and a half. It didn't stun his growth. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no, like, come on, like. 12, 10, 8, yeah, 6, 4. Simple pyramid. <laughs> simple simple pyramid. High rep, set reps. That's simple the way it pyramid. was done. Yeah. Like, there's no, there was no special. Everyone was doing the same thing. Right. Like, that's what, you got the magazine every three months. Like, the new ones came out. That's what you did. Like, now right. it's so much misconception and. And just stupidity out there on social media. I saw a running video and I was like, you know, like I don't run a lot. I just, I got both meniscus paired, but I, I walk, I hike, I do the hills. You know, we were yeah. talking about that. And I saw this guy running and he had a net, uh, like a backpack, right? And he had 40 he had plates in it, right? And he had plates in it and he's stacking it up. And he's like, yeah, you know what? When I do the hills, I like to have the weights on my back and I, you know, position my legs like this and the plates <laughs> fell out of the back of the, of the, of the backpack because they weren't able to hold the material and hit them in the back of the heels. And Derek, you're the running, off. Derek, you're the running this expert. Like, you're the so running expert. It's stupid. Derek, you're, <laughs> you're the running expert here. I, I want to get your opinion on that. I've never understood that people will be running with a weight vest on. And I'm like, why don't you just run faster without it on? Like, what's the point? I, I don't, I mean, it's just like anything. It's like, oh, I'm a runner. If I add weight to it, it'll make it better. Like, it, there's no thought process around, like, what the implications of that are. Like, because... We'll discuss that. I know the answer to it, but let our public, let, let our uh, viewership know why is it a bad idea? Or why could it be a bad well, idea? Well, it's just like, it's a, it's a dynamic movement that involves vertical and horizontal forces and three-dimensional forces. And as soon as you add more weight, it gets a lot more dangerous, right? It just, you know, it's just, you can't judge how your body is going to respond and the time, the flight time versus where you land. And so you, you add weight on it, it just throws everything off, right? Like there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a the device they use for rehab. It's called an alter G treadmill where it blows air basically up your ass and it makes you lighter and they use it for rehab. And I don't like using that because it throws people's perception of, movement off right like it's like being on the moon and i think adding weight uh to, to that movement confuses you and it, it makes it dangerous right so yeah but when you're when you're running because running's a ballistic so like when you're running walking i have no problem with it, but faster I, do more do hill run hills but don't like don't throw like plates on your back <laughs> yeah it's funny it went right through the back of the knapsack and hit him in the back of the heels but you had to hear this guy he's very like well, what I like to add resistance to my training, it makes me faster. It, it adds hypertrophy in my quadriceps and my, quad, you know, and I like to have my, and it was just funny because all the plates fell out of the back. Yeah, <laughs> it was so <laughs> Derek, I didn't even realize, we're, we're, like an hour, we're like an hour in already. We're going to have to do a part two with Frank. <laughs> we can we can cover 500 topics, man. Listen, thanks for coming on. I oh, mean, absolutely. Uh, could you let everyone know where can they find you if they have questions, social media, things you're working social on? Social media. Go to Frank underscore Seppi, S-E-P-E. -E. Check it out. And obviously you can see our sleeveless workout show, mm -hmm. Muscle and Fitness, military podcast with myself and Rob Wilkins. Um, we have so many stuff. You have, a, you have a protein bar coming out, which is freaking delicious, by the way, Derek. We have to get you a few. Protein bar coming out, training apps. We have a bunch of stuff. But books. Yeah, go to books. But go, yeah, go to Frank Seppi, all the stuff's there. Well, love you, man. Thank love you. you. Thanks, Listen, Derek. Derek, thank you. And we're going to have him on again. It's just too much to cover, and it's impossible to do it with this guy um, in an hour. You need like days. <laughs> we got to do the, we got, I, I want to talk about like just business and what Frank has learned and how he's succeeded. Cover on that, that next time. Let's, let's yeah. do a part two. We haven't really done, we've had people on, but we actually haven't done a part two. Like we should do a part two when I get back from Europe. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you, buddy.